Welcome back to the lab. Today we are finally going to unbox the fabs we received from all PCB. We didn't get a good chance to do a formal incoming inspection of the boards that we received just because we were busy getting ready for everything else involved in the final assembly of these boards. I feel like that was a miss, so let's circle back and do a more formal evaluation of the quality of all PCB's work. We're about to evaluate the packaging, component placement accuracy, quality of solder joints, and really just provide our general review of the full experience about what all PCB delivered and what we think about working with them. When we're done, we'll give our final recommendation and grade the work that all PCB did for us. Before we get into all that, let's take a brief pause to tell you about the next round of design sponsorships that we're launching. Check this out. Maybe you want to control something connected to mains, but don't know how to do it safely. We can help with that. That's what this contest is all about. Okay, that sounds great. Here's how to enter. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about your project. Tell us how we can help. Best of luck. I hope you're as excited to work with me as I am to you. So thank you for watching EE for everyone. And I cannot wait to hear about your next great project. All right. Let's dive into our inspection and review. We opened up our box from all PCB the first time on our live stream a couple weeks back. Our first finding became immediately obvious. No ESD bags, what? Epic fail. ESD safe materials like this pink plastic or the blue plastic seen all over the place in shipments from Digikey. This stuff does not build static, but it doesn't provide any protection from ESD. If you're shipping something like a resistor or capacitor, not every component really requires ESD protection. But when ESD protection is required, like for our assembled PCBs, you need to put them in a static shielding bag. If you won't take my word for it, check out this video from EEV blog where he covers the same thing in detail. He even zaps some stuff and sees that it breaks. These shielding bags consist of a constant sheet of metal that's then coated with plastic on either one or both sides to prevent the conductive layer from actually shorting out other things around it. The specific construction of this varies a bit, but the function is the same overall. We need to make sure there's a Faraday cage or that continuous layer of conductive material surrounding the board. This means that any potential ESD strikes will hit that conductive layer and skirt around the surface of the ESD bag around the sensitive components instead of through the sensitive components, destroying things in its wake. Redirecting this energy around our boards by putting it in a shielding bag protects that PCB. And without that conductive layer protecting our PCBs from ESD zaps, I'm betting these boards took a couple hits on their journey between China and the US, especially since I got a nice letter from Customs saying they took out my boards for closer inspection. And I am just sure they did that at a static controlled workstation. Yep, absolutely sure. So yeah, right out of the gate, fail number one. I should scrap these boards outright and tell all PCB to make them again and this time ship them with proper static controls. Completely unacceptable. Either I'm feeling nice today or I know they won't care. So either way, until we find a board with a specific issue due to their terrible static or ESD control, I'll give them a pass for now. Packaging and shipment is easier to fix than terrible manufacturing quality, so let's dive a little deeper into that quality to figure out if we should think about all PCB for another second. If you put a terrible board in great packaging, it'll still be a terrible board. If you put a great board in the crappy packaging, it might come out damaged. All PCB was responsible for both the PCB fab and the assembly. Let's take a moment to get a closer look at the PCB solder sample they sent us to get a good look at the quality of their work. When evaluating the quality of all PCB's fab, there's a couple things that I really want to investigate here. Let's start running through the list. Dimensional accuracy of copper shapes was the first thing that came to mind, but it's really difficult for us to evaluate with the tools I have on hand. We've got a sticker that came with our microscope that provides a frame of reference when using that scope, but I don't trust the screen printing on this little plastic card more than I trust the etching process for our PCB. To me, using that little printed scale would be like measuring our trace width in bananas. Sure, I could do it, I could take the measurement, but we couldn't really make any decisions based on it, it wouldn't really mean anything to us. The dimensional accuracy of our copper shapes 
is good enough. Good enough in this case means it is exactly right to the point that I cannot measure the difference between what it is and what it should be with any degree of accuracy worth complaining about. We gave this an A rating. On to the next test. Let's see what's going on with the solder mask on this PCB. Now, solder mask is something we can dive into a little deeper. We want to verify four main things. We'll start by verifying that there are no pinholes in the solder mask. Pinholes would be small holes in the solder mask, and these holes can cause us some issues. We'll verify this by zooming in with our scope on the surface of the board itself and look for any weird textures or surface imperfections in the coating. I didn't see anything while recording this microscope footage while we were streaming, but let me know if you noticed something that we didn't pick up on. As far as I'm concerned, this looks pretty good to me. Let's zoom out a bit and look at any solder mask touch-ups that were done. This would indicate that there was an area defect where the fab house may have had adhesion issues, then they had to come back over that board with a glorified paint pen. We found some globs of something on the board, but I'm not really sure what it is. At first I thought it was solder mask, for sure, but then after closer inspection with the scope, I'm not so sure. The unknown substance appears to have a similar color to epoxy rather than the black color of the solder mask. Now I thought this might have been flux, but it's not soluble in isopropyl alcohol. The thing that keyed me into this not being solder mask is that I found some, some of this substance on top of components, whereas solder mask touch-ups would only occur under components. It's far more likely that this glob was some form of flux that requires some nasty chemicals to dissolve. We ended up giving this a B rating since there may not have been any solder mask touch-ups, but we couldn't really be sure. There was a lot of little weird spots on the board, but I mean, a B is still a pretty good rating after all. It's time to think about the core functionality of the solder mask. How resistant is the solder mask to solder sticking to it, and does it protect our PCB from the soldering process? I'd rate this at a C. The solder mask did a sufficient job of preventing solder from wicking down traces where it shouldn't or jumping onto adjacent pads. It works. However, solder just sticks so well to the solder mask. If my soldering iron gets even a little close to the soldering mask, to that solder mask, you bet that a glob of solder is gonna jump down and cement itself onto the board. It's not really shorting anything out, it's just stuck against the solder mask but it's annoying for sure and requires a lot of cleanup. On this board, the solder sticking to solder mask was worse than every other board I've worked on, though I don't remember if any of those other boards had black solder mask, so this could be partially a black solder mask thing and not an all PCBs technology thing. But speaking of cleaning, let's talk about the durability of the solder mask that all PCB used. No complaints here. Despite needing to scrub hundreds of little stuck solder bits off the PCBs after assembling the through-hole parts, I didn't have a single instance where the scrubbing wore through the solder mask, and I never noticed a time when ripping the stuck solder off of the solder mask would damage the solder mask in any appreciable way. A plus here. This solder mask stood up to a lot of abuse. Perhaps most importantly, let's take a real close look at the solder mask alignment to copper shapes. If the solder mask ever covers the top of a component pad, that means that the component lead will actually be suspended one solder mask thickness above the pads instead of directly on the pads themselves. This can be a huge issue for manufacturing and could actually lead to an increased defect rate when assembling boards if this defect is present. Why? Well, there's a couple reasons. One of those reasons is because that solder ends up needing to fill that gap. This means you need more solder in the solder joint, and that needs to be accounted for in the thickness of a solder stencil or the size of the aperture in that solder stencil, and it probably isn't. If there is not enough solder on the pad, it's just not going to be a good joint. At any rate, this board checked out okay. We picked some pads around the board edge on all four sides and a few pads in the center of the board. The alignment definitely was not perfect. The alignment was actually pretty bad. Trusting the 10 mil trace width as perfect, it seems like their solder mask alignment was about 5 mils off in one direction. That made the ring of bare fiberglass surrounding each pad pretty small on one edge of the pad. But we never saw a pad that showed the solder mask actually overlapping the pad, so we gave this a B as well. Alright, the solder mask has been evaluated, checked out okay. What's next? Silkscreen. 
Funny enough, the layer alignment of the silk screen to the pads and the components seemed better than the layer alignment between the solder mask and the copper, which is funny because the solder mask alignment is way more important than the silk screen alignment. What? Either way, we gave it an A because it was way better than it needed to be, and the color accuracy of the silk screen was also excellent. It's a very bright white color, no yellow tints or anything to speak of. The general quality of the solder mask did leave something to be desired. It seems like this was printed as a sequence of lines with thickness rather than as a graphic. I'm not sure if the Gerbers of the silkscreen printing operation are to blame for this, but either way, it makes the silkscreen look pretty objectively bad. This got a B- from me. The drill tolerances all checked out okay. The consistency and tenting really lacked on some boards, especially our solder sample. In a cluster of five views we got on the screen, all five showed different levels of coverage with regards to being tented, untented, partially tented. Really speaks to a lack of process control and just didn't feel good. Additionally, it looked like there was some significant fissures on the Enig surface, the plated surface finish of the, and the inside of plated through holes. And that leaves me with some concerns about the potential for breaks or cracks in the, continu in the continuity in the middle of my vias or in any through hole not filled with solder. The drill alignment to the center of pads and vias was also not great, within tolerance for sure, but there were a couple of real oddball drills off in the weeds. When thinking about drill accuracy, I'd expect this to be kind of like a gradient error across the board. At one point, it might be very accurate, and in another location, it might be a few mils or a few thousandths of an inch off center. I'd expect to see a gradient of continually increasing error between those two points. But what we observed was very tight tolerances in the drill all over the board. But then there's just a few oddball holes that were like two or three mils off center and worse than all the other components. Super weird. It's like their CNC machine just lost its mind for half a second. Our drill evaluation earned two B ratings, because that just shouldn't happen. The last thing we inspected was the Enig plating itself. There are a few defects that could happen here. A streaky or otherwise uneven gold plating, black pad, which is a defect that destroys solderability and causes the gold pads to turn a black color. Overplating, which would be gold deposited somewhere that it shouldn't be, and a general assessment of how the plating looks on the inside of through holes. We gave three A's and a B here. The only check that got some points taken away was the through hole plating, and that was due to the visible cracks. Like With my eye, I didn't even need to zoom in, there's visible cracks present in every drilled hole big enough to look inside. Probably in the vias too. All right, so the PCB inspection's done. How did we score? Not perfect, but certainly some room for improvement exists. I have every reason to believe that the board delivered to me by all PCBs absolutely within their advertised manufacturing tolerances. Let's see if my grade reflects that. All PCB came in just under a 90%. We don't grade on a curve here, so that's an AB or a B plus. I think that comes out to like a 1.7 on the German scale. High marks for sure, nothing to be upset about. All right, what about assembly? We really dug into this board looking at the placement accuracy of components. We ensured that the polarized components were all installed correctly. These checks both came back great. All PCB did a great job of placing our components accurately and in the correct orientation. When it came to actually soldering the parts on the board, we took a close look at the heel and toe fillets of each component. These all looked pretty good. All PCB did a great job of fine tuning our solder stencil by selecting an appropriate thickness of that stencil. If they edited any apertures in our stencil, they certainly didn't make anything worse. There were no tombstone components, components pulled perpendicular to the board, no excessive solder or shorts, so that's awesome. Tombstoning is one of those issues that comes down to good PCB design in 90% of cases, but there are things that an assembler can do to make the reflow process to make tombstoning more or less of an issue. I'm sure our PCB wasn't perfect, so their process must be pretty well tuned. We didn't see any shorted pins in the three boards that we had a close look at, and overall, every check regarding assembly came back pretty good. Flying colors, actually, absolutely great, A's all around. The only check that found sour grapes was the general quality category. There were tiny balls of solder all over the board. It's like solder paste was raining down on top of this board throughout the process. Some of the solder was actually on top of components, 
indicating that it was somehow raining down on the board after components were placed. Now I've seen this FOD or foreign objects and debris littering every board we've had a close look at. Now that we pulled this under a microscope, it became clear that this foreign objects and debris or this FOD is much worse than we thought because most of the debris is actually loose solder balls, which means that it's mostly conductive debris. Yee! This could be a factor in why there's so much solder sticking to the solder mask too. There might be little balls of solder on the solder mask itself, and those small solder balls may be acting like seeds for larger globs of solder to take root and stick. Not great at all. They get a C here. The placement, quality of soldering, and everything else looks great, but you've gotta deliver clean boards. Like having solder balls literally scattered covering a board like this, unacceptable. The wash step they did was not great, if they even did a wash. Their assembly score, glad you asked. They came in just above a 92%, so they get an A here. Not an A+, plus, but an A. Nothing feature breaking. Nothing that would make these boards not work. Overall, the quality of the boards delivered post-assembly, pretty great. The combined quality of the PCB and the assembly was great. The boards they delivered didn't wow me in any particular way, but the quality was certainly sufficient. And if all PCB delivers boards, I'm confident they can achieve this level of quality repeatedly. They've given me no indication of special treatment, and honestly, why should they? We're just a tiny tech channel of but 100 people messing around in the shop. Don't get me wrong, I love each and every one of you individually, but I just mean we're totally flying under the radar here, and I feel like we got a pretty honest sample of what their capabilities are. Speaking of under the radar, let's talk about our experience with AllPCB. My biggest, my absolutely biggest complaint with AllPCB is about their quoting process. Do not trust the online assembly quote. I found AllPCB because their quote on PCB Shopper was the lowest by a huge margin. However, after they had fabbed my boards, they came back and said the online quote of $98 was not correct. Instead, they said I would need to pay $530 for assembly. Nope, not happening. After a few rounds of negotiation, we were able to talk them down to match their competitors' quotes of around $300. They raked me over the coals for sure, and I do not appreciate companies that don't honor their initial quoted prices. Their boards were good. We had five boards assembled. This was not $500 good. This was not $300 good. This was like $200 good at best. It took seven days of negotiation to get all PCB to a reasonable cost, and then the delays started. I was told that the PCBs needed to be fabbed again, that the parts got stuck in customs, that one of their workers was on vacation. The list goes on. Funny enough, when I eventually submitted a PayPal claim that put their funds on hold, the parts magically got through customs the very next day. And the PCBs were ready to go and they had my boards assembled and shipped in less than 48 hours. You know what that tells me? Either all PCB has some serious strings to pull in customs, all PCB's timing was incredibly coincidental, or they could have finished the assembly of my boards anytime they wanted and just sat on it until I shouted loud enough. Their total assembly time took somewhere between 40 and 60 days from my initial order to delivery in the US with my escalation. If I didn't escalate the issue to prevent losing the protections from credit card and PayPal payments, I have no idea how long LPCB may have drugged their feet to prevent needing to actually do the assembly. Perhaps they were just really busy, slammed even, and I just got put on the back burner, but I got jerked around with pricing and I doubt whether or not they hit real technical challenges that delayed delivery. For example, the issues just seemed organizational and hand-wavy to me. After all, they told me that they found a PCB defect in the assembly step when electronic testing of the PCB was the last step of their PCB manufacture process. Something just doesn't add up there. It just doesn't make technical sense. In conclusion, all PCB provided an A- PCB with an A-quality assembly service, but that's where the A's stopped. They shipped this A-quality board in F-quality packaging materials, no ESD protection. Top that off with the fact that all PCB's assembly service isn't honest about pricing if you trust their online quote tool, and the fact that they did a terrible job of delivering on time. Those are some big negative marks in areas that make them almost unusable, and this brings all PCB's final grade to a solid C, a 75%. What did we learn today? Get an assembly quote from all PCB 
through their contact, like their email contact, don't trust the online quote and get that quote before they start any step of a manufacturing process and then hold them to it. We learned that all PCB delivers PCBs with adequate quality. We learned that all PCB does not pack their assembled PCBs properly with ESD controls, making them unfit for production runs or anything where you might be shipping product. We learned that if all PCB were to pack their assembled boards correctly and wash them, they could really be delivering some quality product. They just need to figure out a couple organizational issues and get their packaging and shipment uh, game on point. All PCB needs to end their stupid negotiations by quoting their services accurately. All PCB needs to package their boards for shipment correctly. All PCB needs to wash their assembled PCBs before shipment. If they do all that, I'd have no issues with ordering from them again. But until they can fix those issues, I'm probably going to keep on looking for my assembler of choice. A C just isn't good enough for me to give a recommendation. Our UPS is really coming together. We're well on our way through this awesome project. So subscribe to be notified for our future videos where we'll be assembling the through-hole components of our UPS onto one of these boards and start testing the functionality of our entire UPS. I think that PCB assembly services are great. They saved us a ton of time in this project. And if you have an assembler of choice or feel like this video might have helped you to dodge a bullet, let me know by hitting the like button on this video and leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!